What's up, guys? It's KB. Make sure you subscribe to the Underground Sports Philadelphia YouTube channel. Click the bell icon down below so you don't miss a single video from us. And thanks for tuning in to another video from Underground Sports Philadelphia. Now let's get into it. Philadelphia, baby. You're going to love it. Best sports fans in the world. Actually the worst, but that's what makes them the best. All right. I think we are all set. What is going on, everybody? Welcome in to episode number 498 of Underground Sports Philadelphia. It's KB and Matt coming at you from Underground Studios. We got a lot to dive into from the Eagles, the Phillies, the Sixers, and a whole lot more. Uh, but before we dive into all of that, make sure you guys are following us on the socials at Underground PHI on Twitter, Instagram. Uh, follow Matt on Twitter at Matt Castarina. Follow me at KBIZZL311. Make sure you subscribe to the podcast feed on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Leave those five star reviews. It does go a long way for helping this show continue to grow. And as we uh, inch closer to our five year anniversary, putting it to you know the trajectories of where we think we can take Underground Sports Philadelphia, and it's all thanks to you. Uh, and of course. Make sure you subscribe to the Underground Sports Philadelphia YouTube channel. That's where you get full video episodes of every single podcast on our network. You get original content, live streams, uh, you name it. It's on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash at Underground Sports Philadelphia. We're at 355 subscribers right now, hoping by the end of January we get to 400. Uh, so be a friend, tell a friend, subscribe, smash that like button, ring the bell icon, and comment down below your thoughts on everything Matt and I discuss on tonight's show. And big thank you to our sponsors who make this show happen, Main Auto LLC, Security 21 Security Systems, Paul J. Gillespie Incorporated, and the Dental Wellness Center of Vineland. And of course, guys, make sure you go get your merch at PHI Apparel Company, our exclusive merch partners for every podcast on our network and for our entire company. Uh, Matt, I know you love a good hoodie. Hoodies officially live, uh, which is very exciting. They look great. Uh, they're super affordable, and they're even more affordable when you use our code UNDERGROUND at checkout at phiapparel.co. You get 10% off any apparel order with that code at any time. Uh, so go get your hoodies, get your shirts, and get your merch so you can uh, you know stand out in the crowd, whether you're going down to the link the Wells Fargo Center, Subaru Park, Citizens Bank Park, Xfinity Live, or wherever you're catching uh, your favorite sports team's games, phiapparel.co, use code UNDERGROUND for 10% off your order. What's going on, Matt? Living the dream. We uh, we have officially entered one seed territory. The Eagles wrap it up against the Giants. They get the one seed. They win the NFC East, and now we get to sit back relax and watch the nfc and afc duke it out uh this coming weekend for super wild card weekend um just got the job done that's all you needed to do and now you get an extra week of rest and you kind of get to see who's gonna you know dog it out for uh your your actual playoff matchup yeah which is nice um like you said I get that extra week of rest especially considering the eagles got banked up kind of the the wrong time of the year uh, Jalen Hurts, you got to see him play, which looked uh, pretty good, and you know that he got some reps at least. I know people were worried about that, and uh, you know now is able to to get a week off because you know like with a shoulder injury like that, it's not inconceivable. You could maybe flare up, have a little more pain after you know, being in a game situation. Um, Lane Johnson, I guess, is going to be able to have another week though with his abdominal muscle <laughs> <laughs> repairs itself somehow, but. Yeah, I think in general, you know, that week off will, will do you a lot of good. I think the bigger thing, honestly, too, is, is home field advantage. Mm -hmm. I think that's that, to me, is the bigger thing. Than just the, the buy is great, but I, I think knowing that, you know, anyone, as long as you're in it, is, is going to have to come to, to Philadelphia to get through you is, is a, a huge thing to have. And you, we all know the advantage that the Eagles have playing at the link and just, you know, that crowd noise behind you and just the environment of the postseason at Lincoln Financial Field is absurd. Um, we saw it all of 2017. We've seen it in the past since that stadium's been open. So the home field advantage is, is massive. And I think the biggest takeaway from that Giants game, like you said, is Jalen Hurts looked perfectly fine. Yeah, that's, you know, and that was a worry, obviously. And it 
it's good to have that cleared up going into the playoffs. Like, you know, I, I can see the side too where he doesn't play, and I think that's what's dominating the discussion. Not this week, obviously, mm-hmm. this, but you know, next week when you find out whoever the Eagles will be playing, that's I think what is just you know dominating discussion. And you know, rather than anything about the matchup, it's about well, we haven't seen Jalen Hurts in what it would have been like a month at that point. Um, you know, that would be the 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 larger discussion. I think you've kind of avoided that now, which is nice. And yeah, I I think it's. It's good. It's a, it's a good situation to find yourself in. Of course it is. I mean, you're the number one seed. Like that. That's never a bad thing. <laughs> yeah. And the only other two times that's happened, the Eagles have gone to the Super Bowl and well, or yeah, won it. <laughs> so I mean, it, the the history in terms of like getting there at least is yeah. is there. I think in um, general, being the number one seed is historically yeah. a very, you know, you're not getting a New York Giants six seed or Packers six seed every year. Right. So that's a benefit um, for the Eagles. And then they set a franchise record for most wins in a season, obviously with the additional game now on there, a lot of past history. They wouldn't have had that opportunity, but 14 games uh, does the trick, and that is the franchise record there. I don't know if they set the uh, single-season NFL sack record or not. I know they were very close during that Giants game. I think they were two away. I don't know if they ended up getting the additional two or not. Um, but very funny quotes came out today. Davis Webb said that uh, Brandon Graham and Fletcher Cox were talking to him the entire game saying, we want that sack record. And uh, Davis Webb said that, uh, yeah, I'm sure you do. And then he said the scariest one was Hassan Reddick because he just didn't talk the entire game. Yeah. Um, I am looking. I think it's still the Bears was 72. So it came close. Yeah. Uh, yeah, the Eagles finished with 70. Okay. Um, Still behind the unreal. 89 Vikings with 71 and the 84 Bears with 72. Still so. a crazy amount. I mean, yeah, the only team from, like, this kind of more modern era is the 2000 Saints wow. in this, like, top list with uh, 66. But most of these teams are from the 80s and 90s, um, if not like, even earlier than that. So uh, I'm trying to find just even, like – 2006 Chargers wow. are like way down on the list, but um, yeah, for the most part, this is a pretty. If you're talking like elite defenses in history, and they essentially the, the extra from... game does help, yeah. uh, but even then, you know, like it's you know, even if you say cut out, you finish in the 60s, right? Like high 60s, which would yeah put you in like the top five, still top 10. Yeah, and I mean the uh, the extra game helps, and then you know. The Eagles last year finished 31st in the NFL in sacks with 29, and then you jumped to 70 um, to kind of give you like the you know 17 game season to 17 game season comparison. Like the Eagles were almost dead last in sacks last year, and end up in first by a, a massive margin. So uh, I'm sure that's going to help Jonathan Gannon during his uh, head coaching uh, interviews that he's got scheduled with multiple teams now, and we've seen. Quite a few coaches now, Matt, get uh, the axe uh, across the NFL. Lovey Smith gets fired after the Texans win, and uh, they squander away that top pick. But it helped me uh, cash a season-long bet that I said the Bears were going to have the worst record in the NFL. So that came to fruition, which was nice. I feel like I need to buy a Davis Mills jersey to uh, commemorate that. But Lovey Smith gone, Cliff Kingsbury out in Arizona, and they are allegedly trying to trade DeAndre Hopkins now. Um, quite the interesting coaching carousel I think it's going to be. The Cliff Kingsbury one is really fascinating to me because it was very surprising when he got the extension last year. Mm-hmm. When you just consider the way that the Cardinals capitulated on the end of the season, that playoff loss to the Rams was disgusting to watch. Um, you know, and then Kyler wasn't great in that game either, and I, you had an offseason just rife with speculation and I, I think that that extension was bad at the time, and it's even worse now. Um, they also, Steve Kime, their GM, stepped down as well. So, like, a lot of turnover there in the Cardinals. Um, yeah, and I mean, I think moving on from DeAndre Hopkins gives you the chance to kind of have an inflection point here, right, and maybe start to, to rebuild a little bit. Kyler's going to be out for most, if not the way the Cardinals are trending, probably all of next year, right, just give him the chance to rehab and and not rushing back because that team could maybe be, you know, one of the, the bottom five teams in the NFL again next year. So, um, yeah, it's 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 an interesting thing, you know, where they've just – they've never really been a stable organization. Mm-hmm. Like, they've had, like, some success in our lifetimes. Um, 
you know, at least like teams that have been exciting, gone to Super Bowls and things like that, but, you know, just never been able to, I think, be consistently like a good team. Like it feels like every five or six years you get like a good Cardinals team, yeah. but um, yeah. I, They're like the NFC Chargers. Yeah, I, I would say, I think they might have even had more success than the Chargers though. They, well, they've made it to two Super Bowls. It was 2010. Or is it just the one? Is it just 2010? I think it might have been just the one against the Steelers. Yeah. Um, but, I mean, they've been in, like, the NFC Championship games. The Chargers, I feel like, have always – Chargers have always been, like, a first round. Mm-hmm. Like, first bat up, they, they always seem to disappoint in the playoffs. Um, so, maybe it does good that they're, like, a lower seed this time. Yeah. <laughs> they have the chance to be the underdog. But, yeah, I, I'm very curious to see how the Cardinals go. I just read a report, like, while I was having dinner that Sean Payton apparently loves Kyler Murray. So that's <laughs> and apparently Kyler Murray is going to have uh, a lot of say in who the next head coach is. That's good. Um, I'm saying that very sarcastic. <laughs> that's like that's like if you let Ben Simmons decide your coach. I just listen. Like I don't think it's wrong to if you have like especially the quarterback that you're mm-hmm. moving forward with, which I think Kyler Murray is that guy that you can do that with. I don't think there's anything wrong with having their input. Like sitting down, they'd be like, "What would you want in a coach? Like, how do you feel about like these candidates?" Yeah. Like, how, like, where do you think your strengths are? We can all those things. Like, I, I think inviting them to the table is like a great thing, and I think is probably what a healthy organization does. Um, I, I just get worried when it's like you hear reports like that. It's like, oh, he's gonna have a big part of it. It's like he, okay, <laughs> he can have some input. I, I think that's that's a, a an important thing because you know, like the head coach and the quarterback, those are the two most important, you know, people mm-hmm. in an NFL organization. So it makes sense that. You know, they, if they have a good positive relationship, which it seems like Cliff and Kyler did not have, that's important. But I just, you know, I, I always worry about those those types of things, and I think it's players are are good, and you know, they know a lot. Kyler is also famously not someone who seems to care all that mm-hmm. much. He had a study clause written into his contract, and then was leaked promptly afterwards. Um, it seems to really enjoy Call of Duty, which is fine. But you know, I just think like. You know, there there are other quarterbacks throughout the time that seem to have really love the game and love film, and maybe, you know, I would trust a little bit more to be making that choice, but who knows? Yeah, like, as an example, Nick Sirianni gave the Eagles off the day after they beat the Giants, and Jalen Hurts said, I want to watch film. So he, Jonathan, or, uh, Shane Steichen, and uh, the Eagles quarterback coach, who I'm just drawing a blank on his name, I'll watch film the next day. Yeah. Um, that kind of shows you the type of quarterback the Eagles are dealing with and what puts you in an MVP candidacy, um, which is exciting, you know, that we'll be able to kind of track that as the season moves along. I don't know if you saw this today, Matt. The uh, NFL Players Association finally did what I think every Players Association should do, and they kind of vote on uh, their all-pro teams. Uh, the first time that's ever happened. Uh, Lane Johnson and Darius Slate both make the first team all pro according to the NFLPA, but you would think after players going on social media for years and years when they complain about who you know gets voted for this and that the players association wouldn't just come together and kind of make their own list because they are kind of their own entity i'm surprised it took this long yeah i i wondered too like if that's just the direction this kind of stuff like and it's interesting because in european soccer um you have like different teams of the year and stuff and different awards like there's a writer's award there's a player's award there's a fan's award there's like a fan team of the season like you have like different iterations and all of them like so there's obviously like one that is the most important you know but um you do have like multiple pathways where like players get a little bit of a say you know journalists get a little bit of a say you know um and i, I think that's kind of nice i i i th- I think you could have like something like that in in the NFL and it it work work good. I think you could you could improve. You know cuz like think of like pro bowl too and like mm-hmm. that's I don't think in any other sport like pro bowl is like obviously the NFL's all-star in any other sport like that is the tagline for someone and it feels like it carries weight like so and so was a an all-star that year or last year as as like a free agent, right? Like they were an all-star last year or they were an all-star 2 years ago. I feel like I see it. Like, I was reading uh, Cowboys Buccaneers preview, and uh, Tony Pollard, I guess, is a pro bowler. That means nothing to me. <laughs> like, I, I I read that, and it's like, I just, I don't, 
as as an adjective, I <laughs> I could not care less what someone is described as a pro baller. Like it has no significance whatsoever. Whereas All Star does. I, yeah. I don't know what it is. I think it's because for so long, like the Pro Bowl, it was like this oversimplified don't get hurt end of the season type thing where like every other all-star game is like played mid season, which would be almost impossible in the NFL. Um, don't, so, <laughs> don't get my <laughs> Very true. They might hear that. Um, but speaking of the pro bowl, they did announce the pro bowl games, uh, skills competitions today. And, uh, they at least sound fun on paper i don't know if you saw them or not um so i'll get your your genuine reaction to them here on thursday february 2nd uh is when these will all go down uh so it will be uh epic pro bowl dodgeball so it will be a multi-round tournament of classic dodgeball featuring four teams of five players that begins with the offenses and defenses from both conferences squaring off and culminates in an afc versus nfc showdown in the first match, the AFC offense will face the AFC defense to determine the AFC winner. And in the second game, it'll be the NFC version of that. And then in the finales, the AFC winner and NFC winner meet to determine which conference will earn three points. Do you remember when dodgeball was, like, being pushed really hard as, like, a sport? Mm-hmm. I think it literally off of dodgeball, the movie. The movie. Um, it... I, I remember it being like something that was on TV. It was like yeah. professional dodgeball. Like, this is... <laughs> it was like the birth of the Ocho. <laughs> yeah. Uh, then we have lightning round, which apparently is new this year. Each conference will select 16 players to compete in a three-part elimination challenge that will leave one player left at the end to earn three points for his conference. In the first event, uh, lightning round splash catch, Teammate pairings from each conference will toss water balloons back and forth from increasing distances. Each tandem that completes all of their tosses advances to the second phase. And in part two, lightning round high stakes, advancing players will attempt to catch punts from a jugs machine uh, to earn a place representing their conference in the final round of the competition. And in the final part, lightning round thrill of the spill, the remaining players from each conference will aim at targets attached to a bucket hanging over the head of an opposing conference's coach. The first team to dump the bucket on the opposing coach wins and earns three points for his conference. It's a little little too late night game show for me, but fair. Next season on Survivor. (laughs) It's like like some B-list celebrity is like, that's on after like the news. Oh, yeah. You know, I don't know. Uh, Then we have Longest Drive, which four players from each conference will compete in a challenge to drive a golf ball the furthest distance off a tee. Each player will get three swings, and the player that drives the furthest within the boundaries on each side of the fairway will earn three points for their conference. Okay. Uh, Precision Passing, presented by Madden Mobile. Uh, (laughs) Each of the conference's three quarterbacks will battle it out in a one-minute accuracy competition as they attempt to accumulate points by hitting as many targets as possible. The quarterback with the highest individual score among the participants is the winner and earns three points for their conference. There are a total of ten targets that are either static or attached to robotic dummies and drones, each worth a different amount, ranging from one to five points. There's also a long toss bucket 60 yards away uh, that is worth ten points. Justin Herbert going to destroy that. Yeah. <laughs> that reminds me of, like, the... Back in like Madden, like 08, there was like the precision passing drill when you played franchise mode. Yeah, because you would be able to do different drills, and like those would give you uh, points that you could like boost player attributes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, So then we have uh, best catch presented by Uber Eats. Uh, The first round, two players from each conference. (laughs) Do they not make enough money? I'm sorry. Do they have to like really sponsor? I mean, come on, what are we doing here? <laughs> They're going to compete in a best catch competition, showing off their creativity, inventiveness, and talent. And in the first round on Thursday, the players will showcase their best receptions in highlight reels shot at iconic venues around Las Vegas. Fans will vote online to determine their favorite catch by a player in each conference, and the players with the highest votes will compete in the finals on Sunday. So that's basically like your your dunk contest almost, right. which I don't hate that at all. And then there's Sunday, February 5th, the best catch, uh, top vote getters, and then uh, the Gridiron Gauntlet, a side-by-side relay race showcasing strength, speed, and agility. Six players from each conference will compete to see who finishes first 
and wins three points for their team. The four-point gaunt, uh, four-part gauntlet, each segment 40 yards in length, includes a series of breakaway walls, a section of climbing over walls and under tables, a tire run, and a blocking sled carrying a legend coach across the finish line. And then we have Kick Tac Toe. Each team's kicker, punter, and long snapper will compete in a giant tic tac toe competition to showcase their respective skills. And the first team to complete a connecting line of three squares or hit five squares total will win that event. And then you have Move the Chains. Uh, four teams, two teams from each conference, will compete side by side in a weighted wall pull that will showcase their strength, speed, and ingenuity. Each team of five players is responsible for pulling a wall loaded up with heavy weights 10 yards as quickly as possible using uh, first down chains. The winner of How the many events are there? <laughs> best of three playoff Jesus will Christ. earn three points. Yeah, is this like day camp? I mean, so I think it's five events on the Thursday. NFL then... field day. <laughs> I think it's five events on the Thursday and then five on Sunday. I Listen... I won't watch a second. I mean, I, you know, I'm just going to be honest. <laughs> okay. and... I'm glad they're trying something different. I'm sure someone will get some enjoyment out of this. It's just not for and me. And there will be a Manning cast. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> not not of any interest to me. Once the Super Bowl is over, I'm out. Yeah. I'm um, out. This does happen before the Super Bowl, which I think was a kind of needed change for the Pro Bowl, especially, you know, when they were actually playing the game. Nobody cared about the Pro Bowl actual game um, when it was played after the Super Bowl. So we'll see how the Pro Bowl games works. I think it'll be best watched on, like, the Nickelodeon broadcast because they'll at least make it fun and there'll be slime on the TV. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, the uh, the NFL playoffs, though, they're set. Uh, any thoughts on the the bracket going into Super Wild Card Weekend? Uh, this weekend feels like just... An appetizer that you're not that jazzed about, like you go out to dinner with a bunch of people and everyone really wants like this one thing and you're like not that into it. You're just kind of waiting for the meal that you ordered, which is next weekend, uh, and you just hope that it doesn't get ruined by <laughs> like a weird upset. This There's just no game that I'm like, ah. You know, the Cowboys and Bucks is like kind of close, um, but outside of that, I'm just not that interested in the wild card this weekend. Um I feel like it just doesn't get spicy for me personally until hopefully next weekend where you got some really nice matchups. But yeah, like there's 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 no game that I think is terrific. That it's just like wow, what a matchup. And I, I think it doesn't help too. I think all but one of these are uh, rematches from this season. Mm -hmm. You know, so it feels like I've right, kind of seen this. I think the only one I'm like somewhat like kind of excited for is Jags Chargers. That can be fun, but I also think like. I think the idea of the Jags yeah. and Chargers is a lot more fun than the reality of that. You know, like, the Chargers have been this team, and I think we talked about this in the preseason, you know, about, like, because they were a big favorite to even win the division and, you know, like, kind of a sneaky Super Bowl pick. They still are that mm -hmm. for people, but I think they, they underperformed. Part of that was injuries, but they're, like, a team that I think everyone in their mind has this idea of what the Chargers are, and then they just aren't that. They're, yeah. like, really not that fun to watch. Like, I, I think people think that they're, like, this explosive, fun team, and they're just not that. I, I, I don't know. They're not a, a super enjoyable team for me to watch, and um, I don't think the Jags are that fun either. But, yeah, out of all the matchups, I guess, you know, it's for me, it's, like, cowboys Bucks, which is, unfortunately, Monday night, which mm -hmm. is, like, not ideal, but... Um, kind of interested in Giants Vikings just yeah. because I think that'll be like I think that'll be entertaining if it's anything like the game that they played already this year it'll probably be the best game of the weekend um, but like I don't know and like am I, am I really gonna watch the Bills and Dolphins and Dolphins without Tua and yeah. maybe without Teddy Bridgewater like that sounds awful and that's not like the NFL's fault or anyone's fault mm -hmm. it's injuries but like Seahawks Niners <laughs> not particularly interested in that no um, I don't know it's just a just kind of a bummer uh, Ravens, Bengals. It's like with potentially no, no Lamar. No more. He's not practicing, and I I don't think Lamar is playing another game for the Ravens. I think no. he's gone. I think I he's, did I think see, he's a Detroit Lion. I like that. I did see somebody put on Twitter um, because obviously the Bears have the number one pick now. Uh, what's it going to take for the Ravens to call the Bears about Justin Fields, and then the Ravens call the Falcons about Lamar Jackson? 
Uh, I don't think the Falcons would do that. Me either. Like, I, I just think that... I don't think the Falcons are, like, on that timeline. Agreed. Exactly. Um, I could see... I could see... I could see Lamar going to the Eagles, even. I, you know, like... <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I just think... I think Lamar is, like, the like crown jewel of like a team and i i think the lions will be the team that he's linked with the most i think i just it seems like there's a genuine rift between him and the organization and you know he has his knee injury i think his i think he's i think he's done for this season i i, I really he's not practicing and i'd be shocked to see him play and i think that's going to make this game even worse because there's, yeah. there's, there's just nothing there's just nothing to look forward to already afc north games are just like an abomination as it is they're they're rarely ever exciting um, I should say the only ones I think that have been exciting in the last few years are Ravens Bengals games, but you know it's it's usually like a, a twenty fifteen game. Like who? Ugh, Christ. Yeah. it's always the weirdest. It's not good scores. until you get to the the championship round for the AFC because then it's usually you know Bills Bengals next, Chiefs next Bills round could be. I mean, you could get like what you could get like Bills Bengals. I think that, so. Yeah, that would be really fun. Um, Chiefs probably won't be really like tested. You could get Chiefs Chargers, you know, like that. That mm-hmm. could be entertaining. Um, and then like everyone's obviously hoping you can get like Bills Chiefs and you get something like I actually just rewatched the highlights of that divisional game last year between the Chiefs and the Bills, and I'd forgotten just how. And that'll be a neutral site for sure if that happens, right? Which would be pretty cool too. Like I, I don't know. So. That's what everyone wants, which means it's not going to happen. Which means we're going to get something stupid. <laughs> yeah. Like the fact that everyone is like, "Oh, Bills, Chiefs, and they have." It's I think if it's any combination of Chiefs, Bills, and Bengals in the I, championship I would be game for the AFC. Surprised if it's anyone outside of outside yeah. of those three. Yeah. Uh, I did pull up Matt from August thirty first. Our uh, win predictions mm. for every NFL team, uh, and I have their actual win totals here. So this will uh, be brought to you by our friends at Trophy Smack. Guys, I know fantasy football season may be over, but there's other fantasy sports out there. There's TV show fantasy leagues, and there's no better way to upgrade your fantasy smack talk than with our friends at Trophy Smack. You guys can go get belts, rings, actual trophies, metal wall art. They got it. You think of it, they've got it, and there's no better way uh, to jump in on it than right now. You guys can go to trophysmack.com slash underground and start upgrading your fantasy smack talk today. That's trophysmack.com slash underground. Trophy Smack, upgrade your fantasy smack talk. We'll start with the AFC East. Matt, you had the Buffalo Bills with 12 wins. They finished 13-3, and three, obviously with the, the one-game cancellation. And good news to see DeMar Hamlin now home. Yeah. Uh, so shout out to DeMar Hamlin. Um Pretty close on the Bills there for you. You had the Miami Dolphins at 10 wins. They finished 9-8. and eight. And I think if two is healthy, they finish with at least 10 wins. Probably, probably win the division, baby. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the New England Patriots. You had them at 8 wins. Got that one right on the nose at 8-9. and nine. Uh, And then the New York Jets you had at 5-6 to six wins. They finished with 7. So pretty close there all around in the AFC East. The AFC North, you had the Bengals with nine wins. They ran it back and just said, hey, we're still good. Slept on the Bengals. Finished with 12. Too much. Uh, the Ravens, you had with 11 wins. If Lamar's healthy, they probably have even more than what they finished with. They finished 10-7. and seven. Uh, The Pittsburgh Steelers, you had eight to nine wins. They finished nine and eight. Kept Mike Tomlin's streak alive. And then the Cleveland Browns. You had them at seven wins. They went seven and ten. Thank you. Feeling really good about myself. (laughs) The next one here is the AFC South. You had the Houston Texans with four wins. They finished with three and a tie. (laughs) They they really, they were trying (laughs) this last month. They were really trying to help me out. The Indianapolis Colts you had with nine wins. They went 4-12-1. and one. Tough. <laughs> it's tough. I'll eat that one. <laughs> the Tennessee Titans you had with eight wins. They finished 7-10. and 10. And then the Jaguars you had seven wins. They finished 9-8. and eight. Shot Outside of the Jags. Colts, pretty close on yeah. everyone there the as well. South is a disgusting division. <laughs> and then wrapping up the AFC, uh, you had the Chiefs with 11 wins. They go 14-3. and three. You had the Chargers with 10 wins. They went 10-7. and seven. Uh, The Denver Broncos. Oof, uh-oh. <laughs> you had them only at 9 wins. Okay. Uh, 
Uh, they went five and twelve, and the Raiders. You had with six wins, they went six and eleven. Yeah, thank you. Pretty pretty solid on the <laughs> AFC front. Man, that Denver one though, that was <laughs> <laughs> the horse. The horse mascots got gotcha. you. That was tough. Uh, the NFC East. You had the Eagles with eleven wins. They obviously finished fourteen and three. The Cowboys. You had with nine wins. They go twelve and five. The Giants went nine seven and one. You had the Giants with six wins, and then Washington went eight eight and one, and you had them with five wins. I definitely underestimated the uh, the Giants, especially. But Commander spiritually, to me, I think we're still a very terrible yeah. team this year. <laughs> we didn't think Taylor Heineke was gonna just you know win games. Yeah. Uh, the NFC North. You had the Vikings with nine wins, and they were the luckiest team in the NFL this year, going. 12, uh, 13 and 4 with a negative 3 score differential this year to end the regular season. Very nice. Uh, the next one here, the Detroit Lions, you had with 7 wins. They went 9 and 8. The Green Bay Packers, you had with 12 wins. They went 8 and 9. And then the Chicago Bears go 3 and 14. You had them with 4 wins. And then the disgusting division of the NFC South. You had Tampa Bay with 10 wins. They went 8 and 9. New Orleans with 9 wins. They went 7 and 10. Carolina with 5 wins. They went 7 and 10. And Atlanta with 5 wins. And they went 7 and 10. <laughs> Disgusting. <laughs> Bad division. <laughs> and then the NFC West. The 49ers you had with 10 wins. They went 13 and 4. The Seattle Seahawks you had with 4 wins. They went 9 and 8. Missed on that one. Uh, the Rams you had with eleven wins, they Oof. went five and twelve. <laughs> Oof. And then the Cardinals you had nine wins, they went four and thirteen. Yeah, that was tough. That's tough. To... <laughs> In my defense, I think everyone got that division wrong. Yeah, I don't. Th- I don't think there's anyone whose preseason prediction looked good about the NFC West. at all. <laughs> uh, we were the same on the Jets. Uh, I actually had the Bills with thirteen wins. The Dolphins, I also had 10 wins. And New England, I had 9 wins. The AFC North, the Bengals, I had 11 wins. They went 12-4. and four. Baltimore, I had 11 wins. They went 10-7. and seven. Pittsburgh, I had 9. And then Cleveland, I said they were going to win 5, and they won 7. The AFC South, I had Houston with 4. Tennessee with 9. Indy with 8. And Jacksonville with 8. And then the next one, I had Las Vegas with eight wins, uh, Denver with nine, Kansas City with 11, and the Chargers with 11. And then for the NFC, I said Eagles with 12, uh, Dallas with six, Giants with five, Washington with five. Um, Then I had for the North, I had the Bears with three wins. Um, Green Bay with 11, Detroit with 7, and Minnesota with 9. And then the South, I had Carolina with 6 wins, Atlanta with 5, New Orleans with 8, and Tampa Bay with 10. And then for the West, I had San Francisco with 9, Arizona with 9, L.A. with 12, and Seattle with 5. So, had some hits, had a lot of misses, but that's why... We do the predictions. The NFC West was the a real cruel, <laughs> a real cruel division this that year. That was tough. Uh, I want to see if I have the Eagles here. Um, I was wrong on AJ Brown. I know that. I, have... I remember. I went under on pretty much everything AJ Brown. I think. No, Except, you actually. You I went... think yards. I went over yards but... and touchdowns. We both went over. And we both went under on receptions okay. at 69 and a half, and he went crazy with yeah. 88. Um, Devontae, we said over 825 and a half receiving yards, over 59 and a half receptions, which was well over. Um, and then we were so close on Jalen Hurts passing touchdowns. He had 22, I believe this year. The over yeah. was 22 and a half. We both said over. If he has the full season, it's probably. Yeah. And then we were way wrong on his rushing touchdowns uh cuz we both said under seven and a half. <laughs> <laughs> Yikes. 
weeks. Uh, and then his over rushing yards was 675 and a half. Yeah, Duff said that. And then Dallas Goddard, uh, 700 and a half was the receiving total. I think he was under. He had 702. Good for him. <laughs> we said under. Um, and then Dallas Goddard receiving touchdowns, four and a half. He had three. We both said over. So if you flip-flop those, we get that right. Um, is there anything else I missed here? Did we get Devontae's over receiving yards? Yeah, he had uh, 1196. There we he go. had a very productive year. Very, very productive year. And then uh, Jalen Hurts' passing yards was 3,450, which I think he was under, and you said under. How much was his over? 3,450.5. He was 3,701. So he got Solid. there. He got there. That's why you play your prop pets. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I think we did all right. I think we did decent there. Um, but, yeah, I'm excited for uh, – the Eagles postseason, but we get to relax for a week. And uh, Matt, since the last time you were on the show, the Phillies made uh, a massive trade. Wanted to get your thoughts on uh, the Gregory Soto trade. Matt Veerling and Nick Maton shipped to Detroit. And uh, the Phillies bullpen just continues to get bolstered. Well, I would also like to thank whoever writes the headlines and wrote Soto to Phillies. In, <laughs> and I was like, ah. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's uh, it's tough to say goodbye to Veerling and Maton because especially Veerling too had become through the course of the season, I think a, a sort of a fan favorite, and he had come up in some big moments too. So uh, Maton as well, I think, was a good like platoon guy, and I think we'd all gotten used to. It's always tough when like these these guys that you kind of be getting a little used to throughout the year, yeah. and you get a little attached to them, and you say goodbye. But I think Soto's a good addition. Um, yeah, I, I I don't really don't really hate the trade at all. I I think it's 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 a fine choice as much as we like Veerling and Maton. Um, they're it's not, good for their careers, right? Like they're they're like it's a good move for them personally, but I also think like you know within our structure, I'm not sure that these are guys that are getting maybe the at bats and the time mm-hmm. that they need. Um, I don't want to say they're surplus, but I think like you know other teams might get more out of them. Um, yeah, maybe one of these trades I think is just kind of good for everyone like mm-hmm. both teams had a need that is being filled here uh, which is important so i think the phillies being a little aggressive too it's nice yeah and then uh donnie sands also sent to detroit and uh do you know who the the other player coming back to the phillies is i do not it is cody clemens <laughs> Uh-oh. who is the 26 year old infielder son of roger clemens <laughs> wow that's um <laughs> Well, let me just let's just hope that not everything gets passed down. <laughs> um, wow, that's I did not realize that Roger Clemens was old enough to have a twenty-six-year-old yeah. son. Man, that hurts. <laughs> when I looked up and saw what his age was, because I knew he was in the Tiger system, but I didn't know that he was twenty-six. I was yeah. like, God damn, that's pretty wild. Um, but I mean, you look at the back of the Phillies bullpen now with. Kimbrel, Soto, and then obviously Jose Alvarado, Sir Anthony Dominguez. Uh, you bring in Matt Strom this offseason as well. Uh, Andrew Bellotti coming back. Sam Coonrod should be healthy this year. Philly's bullpen is looking like one of the best we've seen on paper. Don't, you can't. That, okay, so you can't say it. Just talent wise. <laughs> Just talent wise. Right, but you can't say it because that's how you end up with a bad bullpen. <laughs> We have to reverse psychology here and say this Man, is they terrible. Stink. Right. You, you can't ever get comfortable with this team and pitching. <laughs> like that's when you're at your most dangerous. Um Yeah, it's it's definitely like I will say it is the most comfortable I've been with a bullpen going into a season in like the Bryce Harper era. Yeah. You know, so that's good. Um I Plus think Connor that, Brogdon. Yeah, and I, I think you know they've they've been willing to again get a little aggressive here, and uh, I think Kimbrel is like a dice roll. You know mm-hmm. he's he's not a guarantee. I think people are maybe banking on him a little more than they should. Agreed. You know when like you're posting like the graphics of everything, it's like oh, and you know it's a very real possibility that Craig Kimbrel is not a meaningful part of this rotation. You know 
for this year. Like, I, I just... It's nice if it works out. I, I think people are maybe penciling him in for work that is not yet to be done. Um, I think a lot of it, too, is you're depending on guys that had a strong finish to continue that, which is always a little bit risky. Mm-hmm. Like, there's no guarantee that, you know, the hot streak that a lot of these guys were on in the last, like, month and a half of the season is who they are because we've seen them for their careers beforehand. And it's not, I don't know, it doesn't always translate. But we also hope, like, if you project that way, it's looking good. And I, I think... Again, it's it's the most comfortable I felt, um, but it's I don't know the Phillies bullpen is still something uh, <laughs> that gives me the, the hand sweats. And then on Monday, the Phillies also uh, acquired right-hander Junior Marte from the Giants uh, in exchange for top prospect Eric Miller. He's in the Phillies' top ten prospects. Uh, Marte is going to turn twenty-eight next month. He split last season between Triple A Sacramento and the Giants. Uh, he went one and one with a 5.44 ERA and 39 appearances over six stints with the Giants, which included his big league debut on April 12th. He struck out 44, walked 22 in 48 innings, uh, but his fastball does average like close to 98 miles an hour. So it's just another hard throwing uh, reliever in the back of the Phillies bullpen that you're not necessarily counting on to be, you know an Alvarado or Sir Anthony Dominguez, but he's going to be one of those guys that say somebody gets banged around early. You bring him in uh, and you add him to the mix. Like we said, Sir Anthony, Jose Alvarado, Craig Kimbrell, Gregory Soto, Matt Strom, Connor Brogdon, Bilotti, Nick Nelson, and Sam Coonrod. Yeah. It's um, like you said, it's, it's a pretty good lineup and um, good blend to like guys that you expect maybe to take a leap or, or be a little more consistent with some veterans that you can hope kind of stabilize that and, and give you that experience. So, yeah, I think it's it's a good situation to find yourself in uh, for the Phillies. Yeah, he's uh, Junior Marte, six foot two, kind of a, a decently big pitcher, if you will. Um, he lo- he looks like he was born to wear a Phillies uniform, though. Yes, with, just based on his headshot. Yeah, um, looks good. So that is another acquisition there for the Phillies, uh, and then. Since the last time we recorded as well, uh, the Phillies beat losing uh, somebody for the time being. Jim Salisbury announced he's leaving NBC Sports Philadelphia. Strange. <laughs> Strange departure. Which then proceeded to uh, break the news about the Gregory Soto deal. Um, don't know what Jim's future is. I don't know what his next move is, but hopefully it's still covering this team because he does a damn good job. and. He's like the guy. If anything is happening, Phillies wise, even though you have your Ken Rosenthal's, your your Heyman's, and your your Jeff Passons, like if you see Jim Salisbury is reporting on it, you know it's legit. Yeah, definitely. So hopefully Jim's sticking around. But nonetheless, I mean, phenomenal job uh, all these years covering the Phillies for NBC Sports Philadelphia, and he will definitely be missed. Um, and I mean, I'm just getting. I don't know. I I don't know if it's because it was a World Cup year too, Matt. I'm pretty excited about the world baseball classic because uh... <laughs> i was i was looking at the website the other day and just like scrolling through the rosters and everything i get juiced for it just because i'm a baseball nerd yeah that's, but that's... i'm excited just because a bunch of phillies guys are playing as yeah well. that is cool um be honest i don't care <laughs> i don't care i just don't there's there's too many sports. <laughs> there's too there's just too much. I'll put it this way. I'm much more inclined to tune in to watch a World Baseball Classic game than a spring training game. Yes. Uh that is 100%. 100% true, but it's just it's just too much. There's too many choices. We have to we have too much. We need to, we need to trim the fat here. I don't know. Uh and I mean it happens during spring training as well, so that's nice and you unless you're just like a prospect junkie and you're watching spring training baseball, like, I advise. The World Baseball Classic is much more... It'll be much more enjoyable, just, like, fundamental baseball. Um, And you're not just watching guys that you won't see pretty much all year play for your favorite team. And uh, the passion in the World Baseball Classic is just super fun between the Dominican Republic team, Team Puerto Rico, Cuba. I'm excited. And plus, Mike Trout's playing. And that's always a big draw, especially around here, so... Excited for that. Um, but, Matt, the, the Sixers, Tyrese Maxey, is back with a new shoe deal. Yeah. Dads everywhere are ecstatic 
because Tyrese Maxey signed a deal with New Balance. Oh, what? what? Uh, is that? Bang. <laughs> <laughs> uh, kind of out of nowhere, too. Yeah. Uh, that, that got announced today, but uh, Sixers looking pretty solid right now. Yeah. Uh, turns out when you have your three best players back playing, that's good. It turns out when you're not playing the top of the conference every uh, game on back-to-backs, that's kind of nice. When you get to beat up on the Pistons like everyone else has gotten to do, it's a pretty cool feeling, you know? Um, and Bede was back for a three-game layoff. With, with Braids. Uh, yeah, with Braids. Um, had a really good performance. Harden had a triple-double in, like, 26 minutes. Just insane stuff. Um there's a very real possibility. I was looking this up, and I look to make sure this has never happened in NBA history, and it is on the cards. Harden's going to have some catching up to do, but if he's on the assist pace that he's... Because he's, like, sixth in assist in the league. It's just doesn't qualify for all the... Uh, cause he obviously missed a, a chunk of this season, but um, he has to keep up that pace. The Sixers could have a scoring title winner and an assist total uh, wow. winner on the same team, which would be... Pretty spectacular. Like right now, Harden's averaging 11 assists a game, which is typically enough to you know to, to win you the assist title. Um, and Embiid is like just a tick behind Doncic right now for the scoring title. So that would be really cool. Uh, them as a duo has been amazing to, to watch. And you know, again, we just haven't seen it a lot this season. But the bringing they're reeling me in. I, this is the problem. Is right like when I'm out, bring me <laughs> back like, in. Seriously, I was like. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, and it's like I got it. It's like the Pistons can't. They're missing like two or three starters out of the lineup. Like it wasn't even. Ah, but it's like ah, you know, it's pretty special. It's kind of <laughs> nice. It's guys. It's kind of cool. They're beating cool. the teams they're supposed to beat. Yeah. Um. <laughs> so that's frustrating. <laughs> but Thunder it, on Thursday at home as well. Yeah. You, I mean, you having two like the premier stars in the league too, like two big scorers. SGA and, and Embiid going at it, which is cool. And, you know, the conference is kind of up, up for the taking. You know, Durant's going to be out for a month with this knee injury. That means the Nets might slide down a bit. You'd expect them to. Um, Celtics are playing well, but, you know, you're only three and a half back. I don't know. It's not, they're, they're just pulling us in. <laughs> they're just... Just to really crush our spirits. Twenty-five and fifteen, seven and three in their last ten. Are they back? <laughs> <laughs> oh Christ! Unfortunately, I think they might be. Back. <laughs> <laughs> I just, you know, everything I've said about the playoffs and and that's what really matters. That yeah. I still have no faith in Doc Rivers as a coach in that situation. Is is still true for me? Um, but I think just seeing like Harden, Maxi, and Bead again reminds you of like steam does kind of have an outrageous ceiling Mm -hmm. um and you know we haven't had this starting five together all that much this year either and like i just think yeah you know like you you had pj Tucker to that mix and yeah he's not looked great this year and you know turns out signing a (laughs) a 52 year old to a (laughs) three-year-old deal is not amazing but you know i i think if if you're talking about like ceiling steam has something you know like a they can they can beat anyone on their day, which is which is a, a big thing. And I, I think they can beat anyone in a series. So um, it's going to be a challenge, though. I, Unless I, it's I, a second round. Series. I still think that the <laughs> the path is tough for them because teams like the Celtics and the Nets, yeah. which are going to be so hard for them to avoid. You know, e- again, even in the second round, just continually give them problems, especially with the wings. You know, that's just like a, a weakness of this team, and um, that's always going to be tough. But I don't know. We have Embiid playing the way he has this year, quietly, you know, putting up like MVP level type of stuff again, and Harden has evolved in this like elite playmaker. I mean, he always was, but I, I just think I don't know. I, I think it's a, it's an outrageous duo to have, and then you, you throw Maxi into the mix, and you know, you're only at like the halfway mark of the season. Mm-hmm. You know, so much can happen in these last like 40 games, so. Sadly, I'm looking forward to it. I <laughs> well, the season actually just started because Christmas was only like two weeks ago. Right. So. Once you start getting trade deadline talk, is where the yeah. season is like real, and it it really starts to feel like something matters. But they might be back, which is crazy. Regrettably. <laughs> uh, last segment here, just the fun, the fun banter. It's brought to you by our friends at Kenwood Beer. 
Uh, you guys can go to the Wells Fargo Center now and get Big Kenny's uh, when you're catching the Sixers, the Flyers, the Wings, whose home opener is on Saturday night. Uh, hope to see everybody out there who is attending. Uh, Villanova basketball, whatever it may be, you can get Big Kenny's at the Wells Fargo Center now. And you can use the all-new and improved Kenny Tracker to see who's got fresh Kenny's on tap in the Philadelphia area. you got to be 21 or older to do so. And, of course, please drink responsibly. Uh Matt, I think we had one of our best Lowell Mets moments <laughs> of all time. As uh, so Carlos play Correa. Trumpets. Play the trumpets. <laughs> 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 Carlos Correa signs with the Twins after signing with the Giants, allegedly. <laughs> and then signing with the Mets, allegedly. <laughs> so I know, I know it's like out of his control kind of <laughs> the fucking instagram post by carlos correa is hilarious i don't think i saw that. it's great because it is like the best pr spin possible this is just like so happy to be back finish to, uh, i think the last one is like to finish what we started it's like brother you tried to leave to two other teams <laughs> which go. is fine you're allowed to do that there's no shame in it i think everyone knew when you signed from minnesota there's a very reasonable chance that you're going to be moving on to somewhere else but it's like it's such a funny <laughs> caption we'll put it up on the screen uh if you're watching on youtube which you should uh but it says wow what a journey it's been <laughs> yeah you know shit <laughs> <laughs> a lot of emotions involved throughout the whole process but always believe that at the end of the day god will put me in the right place <laughs> <laughs> I'm so happy and excited to be back home with my extended family, the Minnesota at Twins. From the plus, you tried leaving your family <laughs> twice. You're not even from Minnesota. <laughs> from the players, staff, and all the way to the front office, I was welcomed and embraced as one of their own since day one. Now I'm back to finish what we started. Let's get to work. Fist bump emoji, prayer hands emoji. Oh, man. Um, yeah, shout out the Mets. Turns out the Giants are right this entire time. <laughs> Vindicated. Good for them. Everyone was clowning them so hard. And it turns out they were. I loved that the Mets were like coming in with the big deal. We're going to get them. And then it was like quietly. They got like, three Bs for quietly, a third like, Five days past. Like, hey, uh. I haven't heard anything about that. And the Mets are like, uh, well, we actually got a little concerned about the physicals. But don't say anything. We're still figuring it out. And they're like, well, they're, they're still going to come to some conclusion. And then like a week passed. And they're like, yeah, the Mets are the Mets are out. <laughs> now, I don't know what's funnier. Correa's uh, post there or the Mets statement. Yeah. The Mets issued a 13-word statement mm -hmm. on Carlos Correa. We were unable to reach an agreement. We wish Carlos all the best. Very similar to the Giants one, except even less emotion. Yeah. So. The Giants one was like, we have postponed the press conference today. <laughs> it's, uh, you know, it's really funny. It's, it's a, the best. I, I'm not taking any joy to Carlos Correa losing money, but, yes. well, maybe I am. But uh, it is really funny for the Mets because I think the fans really felt like they were, like, pulling everyone, like, ah, oh, these idiot Giants just didn't want to pay up, and then they were like, Oh, shit. <laughs> it's like the annoying person at work, like, who complains about the work that everyone else does, and yet they're, like, a terrible coworker, and then they have to, like, deal with their own, like, mess or something, and yes. it's like, oh, I see now that this <laughs> sucks and that I was wrong. You know, like, they're never going to admit it, you know, but you get, like, that two-second glimpse of their face where it's like, ah, Record I have scratch. I have stepped in it. <laughs> So that's really funny. It's good to see the Mets get some comeuppance. They, you know, you got to keep them humble somehow. It turns out that uh, Steve Cohen can't buy the best doctors. It's It must be tough. It must be tough to be a Mets fan. Can't relate. It's, yeah, it turns out you can't buy new legs yet. I'm sure when you're able to do that. Oh, it's so good. And then the all the, the memes that everyone's been posting about what doctor actually cleared him for the twins and it's like yeah i thought it was really interesting because the announcement was uh pending a physical it's like well yeah. that's kind of been the hang-up i don't know <laughs> that's been... are you sure you want to do that i know like i'm not an mlb insider but i feel like that's actually been the major problem here with 
the previous two teams was like, yeah, they had a, an agreement a pending a physical, and it was like, like that pending a physical was doing a lot of work in that yeah. sentence. <laughs> like, yeah, I think. I think my favorite one was uh, Carlos Correa is now running for Speaker of the House pending a physical. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, uh, just meet the Mets, baby. It's it never gets old. Great. Uh, and then obviously we've been talking about it a ton, uh, the live tailgate podcast for Philly's opening night. You're going to be seeing us at Citizens Bank Park a ton because, uh, Underground Sports Philadelphia has the Sunday season ticket plan, uh, heading into 2023. So we'll be at 13 of these Sunday games. Uh, so looking forward to seeing people down at the ballpark and being able to be at Citizens Bank Park on a consistent basis and, get some content out there for you guys from the ballpark and just enjoy a Phillies team that uh, we think has, uh, as Harry Callis once said, high hopes. Shout out to James Seltzer and Jack Fritz. Um, But I think that's everything we've got. Uh, Somehow the Flyers are on an absolute tear right now. They're like six and one in their last seven. Guys, this is what the Flyers like to do. Embrace the tank. We've tried to tell you like, just tank it. Like, there's good players in this draft, allegedly. Just tank. Um, yeah, we won't pick them, though. No. Like, it doesn't matter. Uh, but if you guys are you know, going to be in Philadelphia, I'll be at the Wings home opener on Saturday night. So if you're at the Wells Fargo Center, come say what's up. And uh, looking forward to that one. Coach and GM Paul Day on the Outside the Box podcast this week, talking about the home opener and everything. Um, so make sure you check that out when that drops on Friday. And... Uh, all of our content coming out on all of our podcasts and everything. Make sure you're following us at Underground PHI, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook.com slash Underground Sports PHI. Follow Matt on Twitter at Matt Castarina. Follow me at KBIZZL311. Subscribe to the podcast feed on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. We're there. Leave those five star ratings and reviews. It does go a long way for helping the show continue to keep on growing. And then, of course, subscribe to the Underground Sports Philadelphia YouTube channel, youtube.com slash at Underground Sports Philadelphia. It's where you get full video episodes of every single podcast on our network, shorts, original content, live streams, clips. It's all on our YouTube channel. So go subscribe, smash that like button, ring the bell icon, and comment down below your thoughts on everything we discussed on tonight's show. And if you got to the end of the podcast, make sure you leave a hashtag LOLMETS in the comment section on YouTube. Uh, Big thank you to our sponsors, Main Auto LLC, Security 21 Security Systems, Paul J. Gillespie Incorporated, and the Dental Wellness Center of Vineland as we just got breaking news involving the Miami Marlins. Miguel Rojas will no longer be causing us nightmares more consistently as he's now headed to the Dodgers. Great. (laughs) In exchange for infielder Jacob Amaya, Number 15 prospect for the Dodgers. Yeah, well, congrats on your 111 win season and first round exit, you bozos. <laughs> Can't wait for the Dodgers to try and legislate the change of the rules that the, the top seed actually just automatically goes to the World Series. Yeah, shout out to the Remember LA that? Times. Remember when everyone was shitting their pants because the Dodgers and the Braves were Well, the actually. <laughs> it's actually really messed up. And then the Astros was like, ah, actually, a real, a real top seed just knows how to do it, so... Stupid. Bunch of losers. Uh, next week's show, so next Wednesday, uh, will be episode 500. And I think that's the perfect time for us to roll out the uh, first round of ballots for the Underground Sports Philadelphia Hall of Fame. Uh, so stay tuned for those ballots rolling out for the fan vote on those. So we induct uh, you know, people, things, places, uh surrounding this year of underground sports and you know obviously the legend award and everything like that so stay tuned for that that'll happen next wednesday we'll start giving you guys a little taste there uh on episode 500 but for episode 498 of underground sports philadelphia make sure you guys get your merch at phi apparel company phi apparel.co and use code underground for 10 percent off hoodies are live go get your hoodies get your shirts get your merch use our code underground so they know you're coming from us, uh, and you get 10% off at phiapparel.co. But this has been episode number 498 of Underground Sports Philadelphia. For Matt, I'm KB. 
Till next time, we are signing off. Peace.